because of the remarkable fact of America's well-documented and historically proximate founding, I think national identity and any nationalism take on a peculiar character here uh, in our young country, still young country, all, all things told. So a self-conscious and distinct American people felt its identity grow in revolution and war, and its appeal, that is the appeal of that people to legitimacy in that revolution, was based on a set of principles asserted as true simply or by nature, and with divine sanction it was asserted, rather than as a peculiar cultural inheritance, although that culture was important. In practice, for many years after the Declaration of Independence, America retained the spirit of a confederacy rather than a nation. The national political infrastructure, the Articles of Confederation, didn't offer much to admire by way of effective national administration or competence. The Constitution was, of course, the first, or really the most sophisticated and lasting step towards a remedy for this. And it was, we should, uh, we should be frank, a considerable consolidation and centralization of power, necessary both to protect rights uh, more effectively, but also to put in place the conditions for a more unified, competent, and less embarrassing national presence on the international stage. And this remedy was also advanced and, and bound up with, advanced by and bound up with one party in many ways, or mostly the Federalists, and one preeminent man, George Washington. That party and that man in handling domestic and foreign policy crises in the 1790s helped to forge a kind of self-conscious and self-confident American national identity. This is a wrinkle, I think, in America's small L liberalism that's worth pondering, or the small L liberalism of its founding. As my colleague Charles Kessler has pointed out in his excellent book, The Crisis of the Two Constitutions, in John Locke's second treatise, The Classic Statement of the Contract Theory, there's little role for founding fathers, really, in as much as they might represent a confusion of political power and paternal power, two things that Locke was at great pains to separate. He wants to make clear that political power, which arises from consent, has nothing to do with the power of fathers over their children. And so against arguments of absolutist patriarchal monarchy, he, that is Locke, attempted clearly to distinguish paternal power from contractual or political power. But in the American case, we've combined these to an extent, almost from the beginning. The fathers of the republic are our demigods, as Thomas Jefferson, of all people, called them. So by the time that Washington and the Federalists were defeated and partially eclipsed at the end of the 1790s, I think national identity and pride had been fused to the cause of, constitution, of the Constitution and constitutionalism. Some of this was expressed well in an essay last summer by Yoram Hazoni and his colleague Ophir Havery in an essay in the American Conservative called American Nationalists. It rehearsed a lot of this history, but it made some errors that I think we need to correct to get a proper sense of the nationalism of the American founding, and importantly, what it means for us today. Uh, they set reasons of, uh, for reasons of illustration, they set up this kind of nationalist Anglo-Protestant Hamilton and the Federalists against the universalist liberal and rationalist Jefferson and his Democratic Republicans, or what would become the Democratic Republicans. The argument goes that Hamilton was essentially a Burkean advocating the rights of Englishmen and the common law, and Jefferson was the purest Lockean. Washington was with Hamilton in this dichotomy, a partisan of the, to quote Hazoni and Havery, new nationalist constitution, a restoration of the Anglo-American political inheritance that Washington and many of his supporters and officers had in fact been fighting to preserve during the War of Independence. Jefferson, on the other hand, was a proponent of the individual and even radical individualism of a, quote, creedal nation bound by nothing more than reason and consent. Uh, but I think this clean division between the proponents of Lockean creed and Burkean culture doesn't really survive scrutiny of what the founders did and what they said. Indeed, within paragraphs of that last quote, our authors cite George Washington's farewell address, where Washington identifies the salutary fellow feeling of Americans of the time being rooted in the same religion, manners, habits, and importantly, political principles. So I think here you see culture and creed, matter and form working together. Uh, Washington certainly had no difficulty speaking the language of liberalism and natural rights. This is him in 1790, writing to the Hebrew congregation in Rhode Island. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, with the letter. The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. 
All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. Or take Hamilton for that matter in 1775 and the farmer refuted where he's equally comfortable citing Locke as he is Blackstone, natural rights and social compact as he is the common law. The common law is an interesting example. Um, our authors offer its adoption by US courts as evidence of the continuity of this Anglo-Protestant character in America and American nationalism. But it's notable that the common law when it was adopted in the US uh, across state courts and even incorporated uh, implicitly and sometimes explicitly in state constitutions, it was always adopted with an asterisk. That is to say, any part of the common law that was contrary to the principles of the revolution, that's their language, not mine, would, would not be valid. This was especially true for, of citizenship, uh, a topic much in the news uh, amidst our arguments about populism and nationalism today. Citizenship, of course, is a foreign concept to the English common law of the 1790s. There were no citizens in Great Britain. They were all subjects, and they owed perpetual allegiance to the British crown. This was seen over here as incompatible with the more Lockean and social contract view of citizenship, uh, which was based in natural rights and natural liberty and government by consent. And so the question of creed versus culture, natural rights versus the particular facts of the American people and their inherited privileges or traditions, I, I think is not so clean. I, I think in a larger sense, the creed versus culture argument at the founding presented by Hazoni and Havery overlooks the palpable fact that the political revolutionary project, the American founding, in sort of a grand or Aristotelian sense, was to use a new creed as justification to break the culture of British Anglo-Protestantism and to start a new American nationalist political culture. Borrowing, of course, from the salutary institutions and practices of Englishmen, to be sure, uh, but nonetheless offering a novus ordo seclorum that was to be the basis of political practice and political justice in America. So I, I think it's, it's this not wholly new, but not at all principally British or Anglo-Protestant Americanism that should inform our founding conception and in many ways our continuing conception of American nationalism. It was, to borrow a label from my colleague Carson Holloway, a liberal or moderate nationalism informed by a reasonable assessment of the content and application of natural rights and social compact rather than merely the product of the particular attachments of birth, inherited privileges, religious attachments, or positive law, however ancient and sacred. Um, this important principle or theoretical component of American nationalism, which was nascent in the hearts and minds of the political community after the revolution, was then fused with the cause of the Constitution itself when the leading political men of the 1790s defended and then vindicated the interests and honor of the American nation and her citizens against domestic insurrection and foreign meddling and intrigue. Interestingly, as just one data point on this uh, front, in the 1790s, both Citizen Genet, acting as French envoy to the US on behalf of the Girondins, and then ta Talleyrand after him, Minister of Foreign Affairs under the Directory, made the error that think of thinking they could pit pro-French and pro-British uh, domestic American factions against one another to advance France's interests, only to run into a fierce American national sense of pride that uh, transcended in the decisive sense any domestic partisan disagreements. And the reason I've dwelt so long on this correction about the American founding and nationalism is because it, it forms a kind of peculiar liberal nationalism in America at our, at our beginning. And it's bound up with American constitutionalism and, and that the spirit of, of that really held considerable sway in America even through the turn of the 20th century. Uh, we can table, of course, the very significant fact of the Civil War. Um, this kind of nationalism, uh, this peculiar kind of American nationalism, I think has enduring appeal even today. And uh, I think the small L liberal part of American nationalism is likely to provide greater appeal to new multi-ethnic coalitions in modern America than more historically contingent or anachronistic appeals to Anglo-Protestantism or Anglo-Americanism. No matter, no matter the virtue of these amalgams, and those virtues are considerable. I think today, the um, uh, it's probably obvious to this audience here, but the most institutionally and culturally dominant alternative to American nationalism today, or conservatism, 
Uh, I think Julius is going to wonder whether those things are compatible. Uh, the most significant alternative, of course, is the ideology of multiculturalism or supposed anti-racist liberalism or wokeism, as the kids say, offered by the American left. It insists that both the American founding's creed and culture, or any nationalist fusion of them, are evil because racist, sexist, homophobic, imperialist, transphobic, take your pick. Uh, modern leftism indicts as white supremacist the equal protection of the law that was the original promise of the principles of the American founding. It has used the administrative bureaucracy sunk deep by over a century of liberalism and supercharged by a perversion of the spirit of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and its poisoned progeny to enact and enforce a new regime of racial and identity politics balkanization that is increasingly irrational and despotic. Uh, as one data point on that, we, you know, we can't seem to agree in our national political life about what men and women are, uh, let alone what human nature is and what it means for politics. I think these path, the pathologies of wokeness now infect and are infecting at the highest and most elite levels our educational, military, political, corporate, and even religious institutions. And so conservatives in the American right must acknowledge the, this monumental political and intellectual task in front of us. After over a century of progressive liberalism now weaponized into a, a new and frightening identity politics, in a kind of racialized uh, caste system or neo-caste system, uh, we have to adopt the spirit of counter-revolutionaries uh, with a sense of urgency and creati creativity, uh, but without abandoning uh, constitutionalism, uh, maybe even a latitudinarian constitutionalism. Uh, I think the founders' common sense, rather than dogmatic or overly proceduralist, nationalism offers plenty of guidance and inspiration for us. Um, indeed, I, I'm struck often um, the ex about the extent to which the founding, I mean, take to go back to the Federalist, uh, Anti-Federalist, or the early partisan fights over constitutional matters, you know, just take the fight over um, the Alien and Sedition Acts and the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. It was clear that, that Madison, an ardent constitutionalist and a learned one, had no trouble thinking um, flexibly, creatively, and um, non-procedurally about how to protect constitutional prerogatives in the face of uh, an overweening federal government or what he saw as an overweening federal government. Um, so I think we need to be flexible, confrontational, and experimental. Uh, and then we have to acknowledge the peculiar fact of our national politics right now polarized, very polarized that, that it is. We have a sclerotic, half-competent, and yet dishonest, entrenched, and corrupt federal establishment. Uh, it in, enjoys bipartisan support in many ways. Uh, I think the right often unconsciously, um, well, often, for the last century or so, a good portion of the establishment right has accepted unconsciously and sometimes explicitly the premises of their domestic political opponents. Uh, and this stands in the way of real reform at the federal level. So I think the causes and contours, or the cause and contours of a sober-minded American nationalism may only be meaningfully advanced for the near term, at least if not longer, by leaders at the state level. That's an odd place to be in uh, when you're advancing a notion of nationalism, I think. But it's a, a set of facts we have to reckon with. But I think there's, there's reason for hope. Uh, we can be encouraged by the demonstration of recent months in fights over education, uh, a certain kind of so-called culture war waged on behalf of the freedom of the mind and the integrity of the souls of our youngest citizens, and in defense of an American civic history that's noble, inspiring, just, and a source of pride, uh, even a source of positive identity, maybe the beginning of a return to that nationalism that started a young America on its path to greatness. Thank you.